So we're going to move ahead now to our resident presentations. Our first resident presenter is Julia Bird. Uh, she's one of our senior residents. Uh, she is going into pediatric uh, ophthalmology. She's going to be doing a fellowship at Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C. next year. And she's going to talk to us about long-term outcomes in capsular fixation for pediatric ectopia lentis. Dr. Bird. Thank you. All right, thank you for the introduction. And as Dr. Hoffman said, I'm one of the chief residents and I'm going to be talking, kind of piggybacking on the talk that um, Dr. Ahmed gave last night about at the UOS dinner and talking about a study that I did this year on long-term re term results on scleral fixation using a capsular tension device in pediatric patients with ectopia lentis. There are no financial disclosures related to this presentation and um, I'm going to go through kind of an introduction, background, the methods and then talk about our outcome measures and results and then do a brief overview of my quality improvement project that I worked on this year with Dr. Han at the VA. So ectopia lentis describes uh, dislocation of the natural crystalline lens and this can happen for a variety of reasons. It can be idiopathic or associated with a systemic disorder. And when it is associated with a systemic disorder, that is most commonly due to Marfan syndrome. When you're seeing these patients and treating them, the kind of initial treatment or thing that you try to do is um, provide refractive correction, either with contact lenses or spectacles, and try to you know make sure their vision um, develops and is okay. However, it can be challenging because as you imagine, as the lens starts to dislocate more and there's changes, it can be hard to appropriately refract the patients and you can have difficulty with um, anisometropia and amblyopia as a result. So once it's decided that that's really the patient isn't getting an adequate vision with just refraction, the decision can be made to do surgery and there are a variety of techniques that you can approach a um, patient who has capsular bag, you know, or zonular weakness or zonular loss. There's sulcus IOL fixation with a number of different methods, AC IOL placement, IR sutured IOLs, can do a pars plane of vitrectomy and lensectomy. There's iris claw IOLs. Um, but given the fact that this is a fairly rare disease and it's um, in the pediatric patient population, um, we have some data, but we don't have great data on long-term outcomes, and we don't have huge patient, um, we don't have large numbers in our studies. Um, and, our, and there's still quite a lot of debate about even if scleral fixation is appropriate in these patients in the pediatric ophthalmology community. So for our study, our goal was to provide long-term follow-up data on the use of transcleral fixation of an IOL using a CTR device in the large cohort of pediatric patients with ectopia lentis. Um, quick review, I think we're all fairly familiar with this, but capsular tension <coughs> ring was first introduced for, in 1993 to use in zonulopathy with adults, and it was modified by Sioni in 98. And you can see the addition of an eyelet that is positioned anterior to the anterior capsule, and that provides a spot where you can fixate the lens. And then it was modified um, by Dr. Ahmed and to, into this segment that you can also use in conjunction with a capsular tension ring to provide segmental support. Okay. I have hopefully a video that just kind of demonstrates some of the key principles in doing the case. So this lens isn't, you know, it's kind of mildly dislocated, but you can see the um, superior zonules there and uh, kind of inferior dislocation of the lens. So while making the capsular rexus with utratas, as you're going around, if there is significant weakness and zonular, zonular loss, you can use um, MST capsular tension hooks or McCool hooks that can provide counter traction as you're making the capsular rexus, which allows you to create a curvilinear capsular rexus. And now we see there was, so there's different ways to fixate the devices. Um, the Dr. Crandall usually uses two sclerotomy uh, sites at the point of maxilar, maximal zonular weakness, uh, two millimeters posterior to the limbus. And then 
you can see the this in this case eight oak cortex is being used it's threaded through the eyelet and it's going to be rotated into place and then fixated um, in front of the anterior capsule and then once that is fixated uh, IOL can be inserted in the bag and that can either be a three-piece or a one-piece IOL here's another video just demonstrating oh, um, demonstrating a more significant <coughs> dislocation of the lens and still again using the same principles and the same techniques it is possible to do a capsular axis in this type of a patient again using the MST capsular tension hooks you can create the counter traction you need to create this capsular axis and these lenses are usually quite soft so they can be the video is kind of messing up but they can be aspirated um, either with a bimanual aspiration or uh, a handpiece um, I don't know this quality is not the best but We'll move on. So that's kind of the, the the surgical technique that's used here for these patients. So we conducted a retrospective chart review, um, searching for patients who had any sort of lens removal or IOL placement who were under the under 18 years old at the time of surgery, and um, surgery had to be done from 2006 to 2016. This was and either at the Marian Eye Center or Primary Children's. This resulted in 599 patients. And our final analysis of patients included 37 patients and 67 eyes with a scleral fixated capsular tension rings. Patients who had ectopia lentis secondary to trauma were excluded um, from this study. So initial analysis of our data demonstrated a mean age of 7.2 years. Um, our kind of predominant underlying etiology for ectopia lentis was Marfan syndrome. Um, not listed on this slide, but our mean post-operative follow-up was 35.3 months and with a range of one week to 120 months. <coughs> uh, surgery characteristics, this demonstrates that, you know, there were various kind of combinations of hardware used, either with a capsular tension ring and a capsular tension segment. Um, any combination of these are the modified the Sioni modified capsular tension ring, but the most common was just a single modified capsular tension ring. The most common suture type used was Gore-Tex. In 2006, when the, we first started reviewing the cases, that was kind of when the shift was taking place from using proline to using Gore-Tex. Um, I will say that the 9 nylon would be very abnormal. It was noted in the op report, but it would be abnormal that that would have been used, but it was included. So our outcome measures were best corrected postoperative visual acuity, refractive outcome, and presence of any complication. <clears throat> so when we analyzed the best postoperative vision, there was a statistical significance of improved vision when all eyes were analyzed, and when either eye of a patient was randomized to the analysis. We also specifically looked at the um, visual acuity improvement that was 2050 or better and did find statistical significance at each follow-up time period that we evaluated at two months, one year, three years, five years, and ten years. For refractive outcomes, we can see that preoperatively the majority of patients were myopic, as we would expect, and they were targeted towards hyperopia postoperatively, but did have a trend towards emetropization over time, as we see with a standard IOL placement. We evaluated the presence of any complication, and of note, we did not find any cases of retinal detachment um, or glaucoma other than this uveitis glaucoma hyphema syndrome. We found four cases of IOL dislocations, and that occurred, those occurred at post-op month three, post-op month eight, post-op year three, and post-op year seven. Post-year capsular opacification occurred in 35 eyes, which was 52% of the patients, and we had one, found one case of um, UGG syndrome, and that was at post-op year seven. We did not find a statistical significance in complication by seizure type. Um, interestingly, the PCO formation was more common with ADO Gore-Tex, which approached statistical significance, but did not actually. And when we did analyze the PCO formation in the ADO Gore-Tex group, we did not find an age difference to account for that difference in PCO formation. 
But posterior capsular opacification was the most common complication. And as I mentioned, it occurred in 52% of the eyes. Out of those patients, nine eyes did have to go undergo another surgical procedure with pars plana vitrectomy and membranectomy. Um, 25 eyes were able to undergo an in-office YAG capsulotomy. Uh, this rate of PCO formation is very similar to previous rates reported in the literature using the, this technique. For our, uh, regarding the IOL dislocations, we, as I mentioned, we saw four spontaneous IOL dislocations. That was 6% of our eyes. Um, this, is much, or this is lower than previous reported rates in um, scleral fixated cases. And this kind of does reflect the changing times where we're using 8O Gore-Tex, um, whereas the previous reports with IOL dislocations were really mostly using 10O proline. So, in summary, this is the largest pediatric cohort to date reporting long-term outcomes of transthoral IOL fixation using a CTR device. Our study did demonstrate that there is improved vision and long-term IOL stability using transthoral fixation in the app capsular tension device and IOL placement in the bag. Um, overall, there was pretty minimal long-term complications. Most common was PCO, and many of the patients who developed PCO were able to get an in-office YAG capsulotomy. And of course, as is the case with any retrospective review, it is not the most robust, you know, uh, data that we can have. So looking more in a prospective or uh, re uh, prospective nature in the future would be great. And a few other things to kind of note about the study. The surgeon for all of these cases is Dr. Crandall, who is ob obviously very skilled and amazing at doing these. And so one critique is that maybe the surgeon skills um, is why there were such great results. But I think kind of as Dr. Ahmed <coughs> mentioned last night, a lot of these are skills that we can have and apply them to these complex cases and really with some training and practice, get good at them, so. And then quickly to touch on our quality improvement project. Dr. Han and I um, found a problem at the VA, and this has been going on for a while, where it's actually quite difficult to get uh, cornea cultures. The lab doesn't, didn't have the various culture plates that we need, and the patients who come in with cornea cultures were kind of far enough between that each time they came in, we kind of reinvented the wheel for each one, but one day during a really busy visit, visit, uh, clinic after, you know, four hours of trying to figure this out, we decided this is probably something that would be beneficial to help residents and patient care. Um, and so we wanted to both streamline the, how we would get the cornea cultures and make sure there's a process in place and also create a process that the veterans could obtain fortified antibiotics. Um, so for the cornea cultures, uh, the VA microbiology lab has, um, is going to uh, process and stock e-swabs. And so e-swabs um, are kind of a fairly new thing, but we've been using them more and more. There was a study out in the American Journal of Ophthalmology in 2015 that they did uh, review 81 eyes and found quite similar culture results using the e-swabs rather than using the multi-plate process. So it seems like a, a reasonable kind of alternative, and at least we can get the culture results we need. And then the fortified antibiotics is a kind of a work in progress. The big problem, the VA has said that they will reimburse the vets for getting these drops. Um, we feel like these could be a big upfront cost to vets, and after hours in the middle of the night, it's maybe hard for them to pay up front, which is a pretty big roadblock. Um, <laughs> the VA says there's kind of a VA choice pharmacy version of that program that maybe will, well, it's supposed to be rolled out, but you know, that it's unclear when that will happen. Um, one pharmacist did tell me that they, in dire, dire situations, the pharmacy has a credit card and could pay for them, which I think is probably not a feasible long-term solution. But for now, they did give us, give us specific names of three people who can at least um, expedite the reimbursement process and do it instead of having the patients have to kind of go through the bureaucracy. And they say they can do it in seven days. And we're still working on, you know, that other part, because ideally we wouldn't have 
the patients have to pay up front. But at least we have a process in place and a place to start, you know, working in the future. So for this study, I would like to, I don't think Dr. Owen or Dr. Young are here, but Dr. Crandall for his mentorship and being able to see these cases and help with them in the OR is amazing. Um, and uh, I can take any questions or comments. So, Julie, just a, a, a couple. Uh, number one, I mean, when they got a cordial ulcer, they need those drops now. Yes. I'm, I'm wondering if we couldn't work out a relationship with the VA and our pharmacy, well, we'll make it, we'll front it, yeah. with the understanding it's going to be paid. And, and if you need me to help put the cloud okay. to see that that happens, because sometimes that's what it takes. That would help me. You know, a vet sitting there yes. having to cough up money to get the drops, yeah. I mean, it just may not happen. So, I mean, we, that, that just, just, I think okay. that we, we can, should do that. We should talk, yeah, because it seems like an easy fix, but getting the fat in places. Yeah, well, anyway, if you yeah. need me, yes, I'll yes. work Thank you. Okay. Okay. That sounds that great. Uh, and then the other one, I, yeah. I just to point out that uh, uh, you talked about the refractive power issue, which is yeah. huge in regards to all of these intraocular lenses. The younger the patient, the bigger the problem. And uh, this new technology that, that uh, you know, Nick and Liliana are working with and, and uh, uh, that we just had a complete review and, and a lot of presentations, uh, refractive index shaping can go in, at least now for a technus lens, and we're now comfortable and we'll be able to get up to five diopters per treatment and we can do as many as five treatments. So you potentially can move a lens 20 to 25 diopters and uh, 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 the company is very interested in, in you know, is, is assisting in doing that with kids. So I, I think yeah. it's something we can uh, talk to you about. Yeah. yeah. We need to get it as soon as possible. This is, uh, you know, the FDA is going to opine on this here uh, a little later in January or in June. Okay. But if they treat this as a 510K process, which is hopefully the case, because there's no inflammation, there's no right. movables, this is clearly just a very minor procedure in the lens. We could have a fractured precision for these kids, you know, over their lifetime. It's, it's unbelievable. Well, that's and I think then that solution. really makes this technique so robust if you have a stable capsular bag and a stable lens, mm -hmm. exactly. and you can treat that lens. But, but the, the procedure itself is, is so minimal. You, you know, even at the YAG, you get that little bit of a repropulsion, or, yeah. and, and there's, okay. there doesn't appear there's enough energy of any movement. It's, it's, it's in comparison to a typical YAG, it's like a hundredth to a thousandth of the amount of energy that's going on. So that, that is really exciting stuff. So as an aside, Julia presented this information at APOS in Nashville this year. It was well received, represented Moran well, got lots of good comments. And um, Dr. Crandall has asked to, to make a couple of comments uh, <laughs> about the study as well. Well, there are a couple of things. Uh, one of the questions I often get is, is it worth doing all that uh, gymnastics to save the bag? And um, the, I believe the answer, and, we, and we're getting some experimental results at uh, Washington University in St. Louis where their, their retina group backs it up, because the standard procedure done mostly is a lensectomy, vitrectomy, and then suturing in a large uh, IOL. And we have zero <laughs> detachments, and we, and we have zero secondary glaucomas. And so even if you, even if you don't put a lens in the bag, it's worth saving the bag. The, the eye has, needs that space. Yeah, your retinal attachment yeah. lenses are eye-popping. Majority of Marfans? Yeah, yeah. yeah, way, way more than that. In our early days, Alan, remember when mm -hmm. we do an intracap yeah. with the retractions? Yeah. They all detached, all those Marfans patients. Yeah. We almost thought it was was they more doing because they'd all have a bad outcome. And I mean, it, I was at Academy and the pediatric subspecialty day, Marfans came up and someone went up and said, no, you can't operate, they'll detach, which is now just not really thing. not true. I mean, even looking at the other, there's a four other studies, <coughs> reviews on this procedure that there aren't retinal, there's one retinal detachments out of four in, you know, 30 years, 60 hours. Yeah, I think uh, just quick comments. I think great, great, great comments, and I agree with what you said. I, I still warn patients about early attachment. They have an underlying risk, oh, yeah. Yeah. even without surgery. So sure. just for consent purposes, they have a higher risk anyways. I think, as Randy said, the refractive uh, correction is always a challenge. Mm -hmm. The other issue, we had a fair number that required membranectomies and vitrectomies. Right. Uh, I will often, under the age of eight, typically do a posterior rexus and do a posterior optic buttonhole at the IOL. I know it's a bit much when you have CTR on the bag, and can you do a posterior rexus? I've been amazed at how often we can do it successfully. 
And I think by doing that, we reduce, so that's secondary intervention, now you're yeah. doing me, right? Yeah. Now we talk about the risk. The old studies have shown, once you touch vitreous in Marfan's, yeah. the risk goes up to 40% of RDs. Once you touch vitreous, if you don't touch vitreous, the risk is much lower. So if I, if I can avoid it by doing a posterior buttonhole with the IOL for these younger patients, yeah. I think it's a good thing. That's the one thing I will add to that as far as just a conceptual mm -hmm. thought as far as taking it to uh, mm -hmm. those patients who are early on. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, that's good. That's a good okay. point. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.